Well, good evening uh, again, everybody. So Article 39 Articles of Religion uh, that we hold as Confessing Anglicans, and we're up to Article 7, uh, the Old Testament. And uh, this is the article uh, here, and I think it's probably uh, worthwhile me putting that on the larger a larger screen. Uh, the Old Testament is not contrary to the New. <coughs> For both in the Old and the New Testament, everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man, being both God and man. Wherefore, they are not to be heard, which feign that the old fathers did look only for transitory promises. Although the law given through God by Moses, its touching ceremonies and rites, do not bind Christian men, nor the civil precepts thereof, ought of necessity to be received in any commonwealth, yet notwithstanding, no Christian man whatsoever is free from the obedience of the commandments, which are called moral. So uh, it's a, it's an interesting article because there is no immediate precedence amongst the other Re Reformation churches in their confessions to an article like this, talking about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, uh, so for, for instance, the Westminster Confession, it begins the confession with 10 articles on the Bible, but none of them uh, address this issue that Article 7 is, is uh, ad addressing it well, in quite this way. It's not that the other churches didn't believe what Article 7 um, uh, holds. It's just that they never incorporated it into their, uh, their confession. All the churches of the Reformation actually uh, had debates and there was controversy over how to, how to appropriately use the Old Testament uh, in the Christian life and in the and in the church? Um, it perhaps is a sign of the importance of the Bible in the English Reformation that they included this article here, Article Seven. I'm glad they did, as you'll see later <laughs> later on. It becomes actually vital that we understand that uh, how the Old Testament and New Testament relate uh, to one another. Well, uh, the points, uh, I want to make um, uh, two broad points. And uh, firstly, the unity of the whole Bible. And the second one will be the unity of the gospel in the whole Bible. And uh, this, um, the unity, firstly, the unity of the whole Bible, that is the unity of both the Old and the New Testament. As it says, the Old Testament is not contrary to the New and so when thinking about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, I mean, we think about the way we've, over the years, uh, read it and um, applied it in our life and such like. But generally speaking over church history, I think there's three broad ways in which people have used uh, the Bible and use it that way today. Uh, the first one is to reject the Old Testament. And... Uh, to reject it as outmoded and as a, a, a collection of books whose authority has ceased now that the New Testament has come. And uh, perhaps people today uh, occasionally fall into that kind of idea that the Old Testament reveals a God of wrath, but the New Testament reveals a God of love, and that's the God I want to, uh, to know and worship. Well, way back in the second century, um, AD, AD 200s, that is, well, AD 100s, you know, just after the apostles had died, and as they were forming the canon of Scripture, there was a man called Marcion of, Ponti of Pontus. Now, Pontus was a, um, a, a Roman province on the Black Sea coast of what is present-day Turkey. But he was actually, uh, he based himself in in Rome, and he maintained that um, that the Old Testament was a lesser or inferior revelation and therefore should be cut out. And he also saw that uh, the Old Testament had infected many of the books of the New Testament as well. And so he 
wanted those to be uh, cut out. Uh, the irony is, in listing all the books that need to be cut out, that the church was using, he inadvertently um, gives us an insight into the books that were circulating in the 100s, you know, in, in sort of a, in the years after the apostles, in which how early it was that the canon was forming. But he didn't like it because of of the the idea of law that had crept in rather than free grace. And the only two books of the uh, New Testament that he accepted, apparently, was uh, Luke and the epistles of Paul. And even then, he felt that sometimes Luke and Paul needed to be slightly edited. Um, <laughs> this is, it, it, it was, it's really taking scissors to the Bible Cutting out all the bits we don't like, and you know, Marcion went to quite a a, a degree on it, and it's at a time when um, the temptation was for the Greek church to leave behind that Hebrew heritage, the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. But what the church quickly realised is, when you do that, you actually are left with a a gospel you can't explain. Uh, that you need the Old Testament to explain the significance of who Christ uh, is as the Messiah, but also uh, what his work was, what the work of Christ on the cross, his sacrificial death and such like. All our language about Christ is rooted in the Old Testament. And so the church quickly realized uh, that um, as much as um, uh, the church had been persecuted in those early years by um, by uh, the, the Jewish leaders in the in the uh, not only in Judea but in the Greek cities and such like we read about that when in, your, in the way they treated Paul when he was going around preaching the gospel um, as much as the uh, leaders of, of the Jewish leaders might persecute the church the church actually uh, needs to embrace the old Old Testament in some ways Marcion was kind of reading the Bible with an ideological lens which he used to filter out everything he didn't like. And uh, he wanted a gospel of free grace. As far as I, I can remember, I, I'd have to do a bit more work to get it precise, but I think that's how I remember it from my studies. And, I mean, that's helped. That's um, 40, 30, 40 years ago now. But um, uh, yeah, he wanted a gospel of free grace. And so he wanted to reject this kind of idea of law. And that was his ide- ideological lens, which he then purged the Bible. Well, this is actually something that people will do today. They'll bring their ideology and impose it on the Bible, and they start cutting verses out. That's not my God. I don't like that. My God is a loving God. So, but yeah, particularly the the ideology uh, of inclusive love, uh, that um, unconditional love. Uh, they will then read the Bible in this way. And so when they go to the Old Testament and they see passages that on the surface they find they struggle with, uh, they just, they well, they may not be quite as crass as and cut it out of the Bible and such like. They just skip over it. They don't read it. It's just like it's not there. It's, it's, it's cancelled. Uh, they don't physically take it out. They just... They just uh, only notice the bits that uh, conform. And we do that, don't we? We can read with our ideological lens and we go to our favourite passages and we don't take the whole canon of Scripture. So, um, Do you think that uh, all those years ago, Marcion wanted to be on the right side of history? Now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, actually, probably he is probably trying to make the, uh, well, the, all, the, all the things that uh, the Greek mind took, what, you know, rebelled against the, the sort of Semitic approach of the Old Testament. Perhaps it was to make it acceptable to the Greek culture, yes, and be on the right side of history, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, the number of tight synods I've been in. Well, well, Ian, you you would have been in synods too, where Indeed. people talked about the <laughs> unconditional love of God, um, yeah. and uh, how we're all unloving. By yeah, a, a, and but we are we are we're unloving. They are really meaning the scriptures on which we stand are unloving, and mm. uh, that's uh, something that still goes on today. Well, the the second approach is an allegorizing. Approach that is to treat the Old Testament as an allegory of either the church or the Christian life or some moral principles or other other things, and 
essentially, and I have some sympathy for allegory. I think that it can be a very powerful way of an, interpreting uh, passages. And it's like you read a, a, a story in the Old Testament and you say, well, this means that and this means that. And you sort of, by translating it into other terms, you get to the underlying principle. So, for instance, uh, the, the the hymn, Bread of Heaven, um, uh, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, is really an allegory on the children of Israel and their wandering in the wilderness. So coming out of Egypt is to come out of the bondage of sin uh, through the Red Sea, through the death of Christ, and that, that the Christian life is, is the wandering in the wilderness where we are tested by God and um, and and we and God proves himself faithful as we follow him. And and the, the Jordan is that final um, crossing we must make, the crossing of, of through death into the promised land, which is heaven. So it's done as an allegory. There's a sense in which, um, you know, you could establish all those things um, uh, and the application of them, you know, when it says, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart like the children of Israel did. You know, so you could see that, there is a application there, but this is an allegorical one done in a hymn. It's a favourite one of mine. Uh, I think it's very, uh, very helpful. Other times, though, you see allegories can get a little bit out of control. So in the medieval church, for instance, they were very keen to say, well, you know, uh, God's people had a temple. Well, that temple was the church, and the ch- uh, the temple had priests. Well, those priests are what were called elders or presbyters. Um, so those Old Testament priests, which are hieros in Greek, and and, and now the uh, the presbyters were elders. The presbytos is the Greek. They're now the priests. And uh, what was the communion table where which, which round people gather? That's actually the altar, like in the Old Testament temple. And so, what is the sacrifice? Well, the sacrifices of the bread and wine now become the body and blood of Christ. And so they'll speak of the sacrifice of the, the mass, uh, uh, that Christ is, uh, in, a, in a sense, his sacrifice is made present for pe- people to, to feed on. And th- this kind of realist language, transubstantiation and others, based on this kind of allegory of the Old Testament, particularly um, prominent during the uh, Middle Ages. And uh, something that... Um, uh, the Reformation uh, re- uh, re- rejected. Uh, well, not entire. You know, there is a there's a, an appropriate allegory, and sometimes the Apostle Paul in the Book of Galatians talks about the allegory of the two mountains there, Sinai and and um, the other <laughs> the other one for um, as a as an example of between uh, Sarah and Hagar and and such like. Um, and so you know, there's a pro- this can be appropriate, but it needs to be uh, within the the bounds of, of, of scripture and the uh, the reformers saw that the medieval church had gone too far and how it used the Old Testament. Now, some um, Christians tr- today treat the Old Testament simply as allegory. That is, it's always speaking about their own life. It's like it's a source book for the Holy Spirit to pl- pick out stories and apply them to their own personal life. And, you know, God does, uh, the Holy Spirit does lay on our heart verses of scripture. But it's where these verses are almost taken out of the context they were in and applied uh, and not being read within their historical uh, context and how they, they point to Christ and his faithfulness. So I don't know if I, um, that makes sense sense to you, but sometimes we just use the Old Testament as a source book to, about God speaking to us. So, you know, like say they'll use the example of Gideon putting out his fleece and such like, and and that's what I will do. I'll put my fleece out, and well, it's kind of treating the Old Testament as, as an allegory. And as I say, it's not always wrong, but it, it does need to have appropriate uh, guidance. I think, uh, you know, uh, of the of the teaching of Scripture to uh, to give it boundaries. Uh, the, but the reformers went for the third approach to um, the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's what we might call covenant history, that the Old Testament is covenant history, particularly that uh, the promises made to Abraham that through him, through his offspring, all the nations will be blessed, uh, that 
uh, though that promise was not overthrown in the Mosaic law, the covenant made with Israel uh, at Mount Sinai, but actually that promise was more fully explained, and uh, we 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 uh, we learnt God's people learnt the discipline of what it meant to be in relationship with God, but that both those covenants point to the coming one to Christ, who is the offspring of Abraham. And so there's a covenant history, a not an atemporal allegory, but a chronological historical timeline that, that God's revelation is um, revealed over time. So, uh, so for instance, this is the teaching, I think, of Galatians 3, verses 15 to 19, which I can uh, uh, read to you. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul trying to tell the Galatians that they don't need to be circumcised, but to, that, that, that uh, they need to believe the gospel, that salvation, righteousness comes through, through faith, not through doing the works of the law. And he says to them, to give a human example, brothers and sisters, even uh, with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, plural, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. And that's uh, verse 19. Verse 24 says, So then the law is our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So you can see uh, the idea that we have inherited. Christ is the one who fulfills the promises made, covenant promises made to Abraham. And uh, that the, uh, the Old Testament law doesn't overturn that promise, but is our guardian and our teacher um, and, uh, and to restrain sin, uh, bring us uh, to, to Christ. So um, we can think of, just expand on that idea of covenant history by thinking about the ways in which the Old Testament is carried over into the, into the New Testament. Again, I'm, I'm using sort of broad, uh, broad categories here. And um, the first one is, yeah, what is promised in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New. So you can immediately think of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 saying, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, even uh, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. And then the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For all the promises of God find their yes in him, that is Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. All the promises that the Old Testament has for God's people are yes in Christ. And so what is promise is fulfilled. The second uh, way that can be uh, that the, the two can be related is that what is hidden in the uh, uh, in the Old Testament is now revealed in the New. That is to say, not everything is clear, um, uh, or as clear as what might want to. the The prophets were the angels were trying to peer into what was going to take place, but it's now fully revealed. So in Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, chapter 3, verses 4 and 6 says this, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. He's, he uses the word mystery here not to make something that's mysterious and can't be explained. He's saying, no, something that was hidden. The mystery of Christ, something that was hidden. The hidden um, message of Christ. 
uh, verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So when Abraham was said to be a blessing to all the nations, it's slightly hidden, but fully revealed in the gospel that the apostles are now preaching, that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs and members of the same body of Christ, partakers of the same promise uh, of Christ through the, the gospel. Uh, and uh, lastly, what is partial is now complete in the uh, New Testament. And uh, I've got two Bible verses here. The one is, first one is from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Speaking of about, well, it's the introductory verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That is to say that God's final revelation is in his Son, in the Old Testament, we see he's spoken in many various ways, uh, but incompletely. But now he has spoken completely in his son and that having finished his work, he has sat down. We don't need another prophet. We don't need another testament. We won't get the newest. We have the Old Testament, the New Testament. We don't get the newest, the newer testament or the newest testament. We don't need the Quran. We don't need the uh, the Book of Mormon, the the um, uh, that was written, that the, 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 the Church of the Latter day Saints has. We don't need something else added. Uh, what is partial is now complete in Christ. Uh, and um, so uh, I think it's helpful to think about when we're reading, we're, we're reading um, uh, the Old Testament, uh, we think, what is, what is promised here? What is fulfilled in Christ? What is hidden and in now, but what is, you know, uh, hidden but now revealed and what is partial but will be completed and and I, I think that's a helpful way of of, of seeing things well uh, I, the, our article also not just talks about the uh, the unity of the old and new testaments the unity of the whole bible but also the unity of the gospel in both testaments and just to remind you of those words, and maybe I'll make them bigger again just so you can read them. Uh, the Old Testament is not contrary to the New, for both in the Old and New Testament, everlasting life is offered to mankind in Christ, by Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man, being both God and man. Wherefore, Ooh. they are not to be heard. It's a lovely phrase. Wherefore, they are not to be heard, which feign that the old fathers did look only for transitory promises. Uh, so feign, I think it's, uh, we, um, people will feign things, they'll pretend. Uh, this is a slightly, I think, more archaic use uh, of the word, which is uh, that um, to invent. So they're not to be heard. You're not to entertain. We're not to entertain people or indulge people who, who think that, who invent the idea that the old fathers did look only to transitory promises. That is that the Jews looked to the law for their salvation. We look to Christ for faith. No, it's the same gospel that's proclaimed to the Old Testament saints and to the New Testament saints. There isn't two mediators. There's not Moses and Christ, but just one, as it says here, uh, Christ, uh, the, um Everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ in both the Old and the New Testament, who is the only mediator between God and man. People can't come to Christ uh, to God apart from Christ, but because He is um, both God and man. And uh, so, what it's it's saying is that the Old Testament saints they look forward to Christ's coming and the promises that fulfilled in Him, just as we look back at the completed work of Christ on the cross. But we're saved both through Christ, the only mediator uh, 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 for us. And um, it means that uh, Christ is really the hermeneutical key. 
uh, to the Old Testament. So hermeneutics. So I, I wondered whether I should put it in or not. But it's, you know, if you if you spent so long at university as I have, you've got to put in big words, surely. So her, hermeneutics <laughs> just means just means interpretation. So when we talk about uh, her, hermeneutics, we're talking about the way we interpret the Bible. So that uh, when we interpret the Old Testament, Christ is the way we interpret. It's the interpretive key or the hermeneutical key to the Old Testament. That if we don't understand that Christ is the fulfillment and the revelation and the uh, completion of the Old Testament, then we fail to understand the true message of the Old Testament. Uh, and so essentially what this article is claiming is that the Old Testament is a thoroughly Christian book. Now, I have a, somehow feeling that Christians somehow feel it's a Jewish book that we've sort of slightly purloined, you know, that there's Judaism, that's their book, and we have sort of branched off or taken it over. No, the Old Testament only can only be rightly understood with uh, understood through Christ. And uh, um, so, for instance, I think this is... Uh, the, the saints of the Old Testament, Abraham and others, I mean... Um, Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. I think that's John 5, is it? If I That's just off the top of my head. I think it is. Um, but I was I wanted to read you about Simeon in chapter 2, verses 25 to, to 32, because I think that Simeon uh, epitomizes for Luke the Old Testament saints who are waiting for the coming... <coughs> who are waiting for the coming Messiah... And uh, so Jesus was brought to the uh, on the eighth day, I think, to the temple uh, from Bethlehem, and uh, there he is meet. Uh, uh, Simeon meets them in the temple, and this is what Luke records. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. That is the fulfillment of all the promises, God's salvation. Um, uh, of his people and the Holy Spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ and he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said Lord now you let now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Uh, I, I, here we see in Simeon the hope of Israel, well, fulfilled in Christ, looking forward to those promises made to them in the same way we look back to what has been done. It's helpful for us to understand, therefore, actually, how does Judaism understand its Old Testament if it doesn't find Christ there? Well, they, in a sense, adopt a, a humanitical um, principle of the law. It kind of comes out of the exile because when the, the temple that Solomon had built, the first temple, um, was destroyed by the Babylonians, then God's people were taken into exile into Babylon. Uh, Babylon. You no longer had temple. You never no, didn't have sacrifices you could offer. All the rituals and ceremonies that went around the temple uh, were no longer able to be practiced. Most of the civil re regulations that um, were in place for governing you know, um, uh, uh, jubilee years and other things, uh, they could, and the festivals couldn't be practiced either. Um but in, in Babylon, they needed to be able to uh, maintain their faith uh, for that allotted time that God had said through Jeremiah that they were to be in exile. Uh, when they came back, and they, they uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back and they rebuilt the temple, uh, the sec second temple, and, uh, and, that, and that stood for uh, right through the, the time when they had returned, right through the time of Jesus, it wasn't until 70 AD that the Romans destroyed that second temple. And again, uh, Judaism 
found itself cut adrift from the Old Testament and its uh, and its its rootedness in the land and the temple and 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 that's that sort of thing, and and so in a sense. Uh, uh, Judaism had to make sense of the Old Testament in a new a new context, and one of their uh, rab- famous rabbis, Rabbi Judah the Prince, writing in around um, two hundred um, AD, two hundred uh, so yeah, um, one hundred and seventy years after Christ, you know, well, well one hundred and thirty years after the destruction of the temple, he began to m- make extracts of laws. And uh, and explanations of how they could be uh, faithfully lived out uh, in what's called the Mishnah. And then from the Mishnah, there were various commentaries and expansions that were done in what's called the Talmud. The Talmud comes in a collection of volumes um, because there were two great centers of of Judaism. One was in Babylon, uh, a Jewish presence in Babylon. And in Jerusalem itself, so there's the Jewish, there's the Jerusalem Talmud and there's the Babylonian Talmud. And I mean, it's not an area I know too much about, but it does mean that they use the Mishnah and the Talmud as a interpretive lens to understand the laws and how they apply in, in the new context in which they find themselves. Um, it means that without the Mishnah and the Talmud, uh, then they wouldn't. They need that added book to help them understand the Old Testament. Just as we believe that the New Testament is the appropriate lens for which we to understand the Old Testament, so we both and uh, we both claim a heritage in the Old Testament. Um, uh, but as Christians, we believe that Christ is the only appropriate uh, and, uh, and interpretation of the Old Testament that unless it leads us to Christ, then we're not really understanding the passages. As I just think it's helpful to understand how um, we're not coming to a Jewish book, we're coming to a Christian book, because Christ speaks through all of Scripture uh, to us, bringing us the gospel of everlasting life. Well, we've got to a half, halfway point. We can, um, we can take a, a, a short um, break before we uh, look at the second, second half. And we can have a little discussion. So I'll just take myself off the spotlight. Um, so any any reaction uh, there? Uh, so some of you might want to go out to the foyer and get an ice cream. They they, they dipped, you know, they dipped in chocolate, and you can bring them back, get some popcorn. <laughs> Malcolm, my response is, what an incredible brief, concise statement Yeah, contained in those, I don't know, two or three sentences. Yeah, it is quite incredible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, what, what's debatable about it, I suppose? That's the question. <laughs> well, uh, well, this is not as controversial it's, it's, as the it's second. So crystal clear. The second half is a bit more controversial, but th- this is controversial in some ways because, as you'll know, Bruce, some forms of, uh, I guess, more, they'd say, more literal dispensationalism will say that the Jews will be regathered and re-establish the temple worship. But you see, this article would maintain, and I would maintain, that the there's not a two tracks. There's not a gospel for Jews and a fulfilling through the fulfilling of the law, and a gospel for Gentiles through the through the gospel of grace. There's only one gospel exactly. that that exactly. there cannot be a reestablishment of the temple worship. That would be an utter blasphemy. Well, yeah, you know, and, and for Christians to do that, it would be a blast. Now, what 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 the Jewish nation wants to do? I mean, I don't think that the nation of Israel have any plans to do that. I think that would be highly. Uh, it's quite a secular state. I don't have, don't think they are planning to do that at all. But if they were to, and there are many Christians who who see an eschatological, eschatological, an end time fulfilment where the temple's rebuilt and the te- and the sacrifices are carried out again. Well, if Christ has fulfilled those, and He is the one for whom both testaments speaks, it rules 
that out. I, yeah, so and it's controversial for some. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I suppose I'd have to put my hand up and say I, I heard a lot of that as a younger person. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I, I think... it's fair enough, isn't it, to say that the whole of Scripture from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation is about salvation. Yeah. I think I've heard what you said very much earlier. I have come across many Christians who said to me, oh, I don't believe in the God of the Old Testament, but I believe in the God of the New Testament, a loving God. That God in the Old Testament just just doesn't fit. I've yeah. heard that many, many yeah. times. And there's an interesting verse in Proverbs too. See, it says, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Mm. <laughs> wow. Promise. That's right. When you're taking God to court, you're, you're in a bit of... Um... <laughs> well, yeah, you're in a hiding to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> There's also some of the warning in, uh, I think, in Revelation. You know, anybody who takes away from this book... Oh, writes this... oh exactly. And, and it's, <laughs> yes... <laughs> And, and I take it to be a wider application than just the book of Revelation. I think yeah. it goes yeah. to the, yeah, it's talking about the covenant documents of God's people, the New Testament, the New new Covenant. Yeah, and I, just I, as the I, Old I, Testament I, covenant was, Jesus yeah. said, not a dot or a tittle will be taken from it. Yeah. That's right, that's right. You know, Paul had it right. All, underline it two or three times. Yeah. All scripture is God-breathed. Yeah. Yeah, and profitable as well. So yeah, yeah and then goes on, of course, to elaborate. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, uh, so far, Malcolm, good stuff. Okay. <laughs> well, what I like. Uh, let me put it on spotlight before I start talking. That helps me with my editing. I discovered that if I if I if I talk over the top of my ed- uh, my camera moves, I can't find a nice clear cut of my editing. So. Um, Unless I put all your comments on, I, I thought that'd be a bit unfair, uh, so I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know if you have gone back and actually looked at some of them and and and, and to remind yourself of how what what, what was said. Um, well, the second half of what I want to uh, talk about, the second half of the um, of the Article Seven. I think it's very relevant for today and it really is something that has been very controversial in recent years and has really been the basis of why um, a number of us have left the uh, Anglican province of of New Zealand and have formed the Church of Confessing Anglicans. And I'd like to just outline the reasons again to you, the reasons uh, why that is so. Uh, and how this article applies to the debates that we've had within the church. So it'll take me a little bit of time, but I think it's uh, I, something I'd like to do and have have recorded. Uh, it can be on our YouTube channel and, and, and such like. But also because many, uh, uh, I have a, a submission, many lay people have, uh, have an instinct that this is not right. Uh, it's going against scripture. But in some ways haven't had the opportunity to think it through in a systematic way, and neither have their clergy from the pulpit systematically taught it from the pulpit. They've kept people in the dark uh, because they don't want to, they may personally not think it's right, but they don't want to frighten the horses. Um, And because if they teach their people, their people are not going to be doing the compromise (laughs) that the clergy want to do. Um, So uh, I think this is, it's, so I'd like to take that time. So it's maybe material that you've heard uh, before. And, and I'll keep an eye on the time. I don't want to take too long to do it. and um, uh, But I think it's worthwhile doing. So we've talked about the uh, the unity of the Old and New Testament. And we've talked about the, uh, the gospel in both the Old and New Testament. Uh, here, I'd like to talk about the use of the Old Testament. And so the article says... Um, the second half of the article, although the law given from God to by Moses as touching ceremonies and rites do not bind Christian men, 
nor the civil precepts thereof ought of necessity to be received in any commonwealth. Yet notwithstanding, no Christian man whatsoever is free from the obedience of the commandments which are called moral. So it's a division of the Old Testament. It's what I call a heuristic division. It's not a philosophical, technical division of words. It's it's a rough rule of thumb uh, that helps us understand that the Old Testament law in particular, that's the first five books uh, of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the books written by Moses, uh, that the law is um, can be roughly divided into ceremonies and rites, like the temple sacrifices and things, uh, civil precepts, like the festivals and the uh, rules for how to glean, glean your harvest and, and such like, but also into moral precepts, thou shalt not murder. And that as, as the Bible, the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled and as the, what is hidden is revealed and what is partial is, and is complete, that actually the ceremonial and, and the ceremonial aspects of the law and, the, and its rites are fulfilled in Christ. We no longer sacrifice animals because the whole idea of blood and things have, have been fulfilled in Christ. We no longer keep the distinctive dress of Israel and the distinctive practices of Israel like circumcision uh, because um, Christ has made the two one and uh, so that there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. So these things, as we bring them to Christ, we find their fulfillment. And uh, and even the civil civil requirements, um, as it said, is not of necessity to be received by any commonwealth. Now, they use the word commonwealth because the idea of nation or country um, mm. hadn't actually been, it was only developing in Europe at this time. Uh, it was only, it's, it's in that transition time. And so England was a kingdom. Other countries, uh, they had the city-states, there were republics, there were um, prince, principalities. Uh, you know, the, they just use the word commonwealth as a general description. And we have the commonwealth of Israel, don't we? Because the 12 tribes, there were times where it didn't have one king, um, but it could be talked about as the as the tribes working together as the commonwealth of Israel. So, um, so what it's saying is, Ceremonies and rites and um, civil precepts uh, may or may not apply. They're not binding on Christian men um, and or on Chris, Christian countries or any particular commonwealth. There may be wisdom in them and we might use them. For instance, it may be wise uh, to maintain a death penalty for certain types of murder. Um, if we could trust our judiciary, uh, we might do that. <laughs> but uh, they might have to get the act together a bit more. But um, notwithstanding, no man whatsoever is free from the obedience of the command which was uh, called moral. There was a tendency in the Reformation time for more radical people to say, we are no longer under the law, we are free from the law, actually the law has no hold on us, uh, and so it matters not what we do, the law does not condemn us. And so they were used, as the Apostle Paul said, they would use their freedom uh, for to sin. And uh, antinomianism, it's called, anti-law. But here, as uh, the article is saying, no, that's not how it is. Uh, Christians are not free from the moral law. We might, the Apostle Paul might describe it, the law of uh, the law of, uh, of Christ's love, the law of love. Um, and the law of Christ, that we, we uh, relate to others as Christ has related to us. We serve others and lay our lives down for others as Christ has laid his life down for us. So there's different ways of expressing it, but I think it's helpful, this little heuristic rule. Um, we're not bound by this two of the di dimensions of the law, but the moral we are. So um, this has its roots in the moral law. Why are we bound by the moral law? Well, because the moral law, um, above all else, reflects the character of God and his goodness and his holiness. And this is where uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, this is what the apostle Peter says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. 
But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. That is, our conduct needs to reflect the conduct and the character of Christ. Our character reflect the character of Christ, uh, the character of God himself. And of course, Peter is quoting here, as it is written, he's quoting Leviticus uh, chapter 11, verse 45, and, and, and a version of it's also in chapter uh, 20, verse 7. You shall be holy for I am holy. We are holy and the moral law is binding on us because our character is to reflect uh, God's uh, holy character. Well, of course, uh, in Leviticus, these, the very passage that Peter's quoting, we have these two rather controversial verses for today. Uh, Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And then Leviticus 20. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Now, there's such a lot to uh, that we could study uh, here, but I just want to do a, a broad outline of the immediate context, the creation context, the New Testament context, and uh, I, I couldn't help but throw in another big word in, an eschatological <laughs> context. The es eschaton is a Greek word meaning last things. So the eschatology is the study of last things, so the end times, um, the es uh, eschatological context. And my question, why are there no dogs in heaven? That will be how I, I, uh, uh, I finish. Uh, so, um, and that will probably get me cancelled on YouTube, I guess. But um, uh, the immediate context of, of Leviticus 18 and, and 20 is uh, a list of sexual sins, sexual prohibitions. Uh, so, for instance, who can marry who and uh, who you are able to enter into a sexual relationship with. So there are laws against the um, bounds of affinity. You know, you can't marry your father's wife and you can't marry your, um, your, um, you know, all the, all the d degrees of uh, prohibition, uh, which yeah, are not imposed on us, actually. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because it's actually natural for people not to sexualize uh, family relationships. But people who are outside the family, it's natural to our passions to be sexually attracted to them. And that is why the sin of incest is so terrible, because you're sexualizing a relationship, that sh a deep, intimate relationship that should not be sexualized, uh, say, between a father and a daughter. And it's not natural for a father to be attracted to a daughter. It's not that somehow fathers all going around sort of trying to suppress their sexual urges within their family. No, it's not. So the, 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 these laws are actually opposed on God's good order, that they're expressing God's good order of the family. Uh, but in, uh, in Leviticus 18, uh, the wider context, it, it addresses the issue of adultery, how that is to be prohibited. You must not sleep with your neighbor's wife and then homosexual acts as well and then last of all bestiality men yeah. having sex with animals and women offering themselves up to animals uh, uh, as uh, as sexual objects um, this is uh, what Leviticus 18 and 20 which is uh, a mirrored uh, uh, mirrors it in many ways um, they Oh, I have to talk about the uh, finish talking about this immediate context before going to the creation context. So I, I better follow my own uh, laws here. Uh, so the beginning of Leviticus 18 and the end of Leviticus 18 frame the context for those sexual laws. They're not just coming out of nowhere. And the same in chapter 20, the, the beginning verses and the end verses frame the laws, sexual laws. And here in Leviticus 18, verses uh, the end of Leviticus 18, I'll just read as an example. So after having given this list of sexual laws and how homosexual sex is, uh, is a, an abomination, uh, in fact, of all the laws, um, only homosexual sex is described as 
an abomination. Uh, the others the, the, um, are unclean, and others are, are sinful, and others. But there's a there's a degrad there's a, a gradation of sexual sin, and bestiality is described as a perversion. Uh, here in Leviticus 18, verses 24 to 30, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so uh, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations either the, the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that you that were practiced before you, and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. That is the immediate context, um, and it's uh, one where they are to reject the customs of Egypt and they are to reject the customs of Canaanite because I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is the moral <clears throat> law. These um, and we. You know, we can't get to pick and choose which ones we think. Oh well, you know, incest, all oh, that's bad, but but not, um, but not homosexual sex. We know so much more now. Actually, there's a creation context. So I better move on before we run out of time. I'll, I'll, uh, I won't be I'll get to the point where I tell you why there are no dogs in heaven. Um, the creation context <laughs> is Genesis one and two, and that is where God separated the light from the darkness. He separated the uh, the sea from the land the heavens from the earth, the waters above from the waters below. Um, and it's this differentiation. And Abraham going naming the animals, but he made uh, uh, humanity male and female. He made man male and female. It's this separating, but then also this coming together. Uh, uh, um, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. There's a, there's a separating and there's a proper ordering and a coming together. And it's this uh, ordering that's been confused and, um, and um, reversed, leading to a chaos uh, for, for what God has ordered in his good creation is now being disordered. And so that's the creation uh, context. You know, Levit Leviticus is not coming out of nowhere. It's actually got its roots back in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, the New Testament context. So this is where Paul is uh, giving an account of the, the pagan world in, in Romans 1, uh, the way that through its idolatry it's become foolish. And, but, and God gives them over to their foolishness. And, and one of the expressions that Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verses 26 to 27, is this. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Uh, Paul also expresses this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And here, Paul is saying something uh, that uh, taking the moral law and applying it to Christians, do you not realize that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he lists out, do not be deceived. And amongst the practices he lists is homosexuality. 
But it's not somehow that this permanently condemns somebody, but such were some of you. Um, today, the Holy Spirit would be taken to court for conversion theory. But, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Uh, Christians don't practice so-called conversion therapy. We pray that the Spirit of God would wash, would sanctify, and would justify people in the name of our Lord Jesus. And this applies to all sexual sin. We're not selecting them out. There's a scourge in the in the church today of, of pornography. People are indulging all kinds of sexual morality online uh, and in their lives in a way that previous generations were not able to do. Uh, but Paul needs to tell, we need to hear the words of Paul, do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral or idolaters or adulterers will receive, will inherit the kingdom of God. We need to root out the scourge of pornography. And all perverted sex needs to be rooted out of the Christian church, out of the Christian, out of the Christian life, out of marriages. You know, it's not... We're not to indulge these things. Sex is given that we might cleave to husband to, and to his wife to cherish one another. We're not to indulge perverted passions uh, at, at just because we have a marriage license. This is this is this only dishonors one another. Um, anyway, so I think there's a wide application there. I start getting on my hobby horse a bit here, so I just have to be careful. Let me talk about. Um, uh, this is why, just to say, why we cannot see it as a secondary issue. There's some things that, as Christians, we go, well, I disagree with you, but I can see how you're trying to make an argument from Scripture. Um, and so, for instance, woman's ordination or divorce after remarriage or whether we should keep the Sabbath or not, uh, whether some foods are still prohibited to us or not. I, I, you know, I think that I think that we can ordain women. I think that we that we can remarry people after divorce. And I think that we, um, uh, what were the other ones? I think that all foods are open. I think we can eat black, black pudding. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that we have. We keep the Sabbath. We keep the Lord's Day. There are elements of the Sabbath we keep because we gather together to worship our, uh, our risen and ascended uh, Christ, worship God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so there are elements of it, but it's the Lord's Day that we gather. But it could be a Friday. It could be it could be a Wednesday night. Um, but it's good. I think keeping a, a Sunday, the Lord's Day, for that is, is great. But these are secondary matters. I'm not going to div divide over these matters because they're not matters of ultimately of salvation. But what does Paul say here? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. And as our article says, uh, that, that the moral law, no um, uh, no way uh, is the moral law to be, uh, are we accepted, uh, exempt from uh, the moral law. So it's what we call a primary, it's a, it's a not a secondary matter, but a, a primary matter. It's a gospel matter. To tell people, Oh, we understand so much more now. The spirits led us into new truth. We understand it differently then, and um, and uh, that actually God can bless your relationship. That's it. and and we do so because we want let love be love. Love is love. We're not loving. We are allowing them to be deceived. It is it is not in their best interest to carry on in this way. Uh, they need to actually come and be washed sanctified, justified by the Spirit of God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me, uh, how are we going for time? Well, can I pinch a few extra minutes to do this last one? You can squeeze a few more in, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, Ian. Uh, the eschatological context, why there are no dogs in heaven. Maybe a little bit more more controversial here, because I, 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 but I actually think it's uh, there's something that's actually taught there in the end of, Revelation chapter 2. What we see is that, that the holiness code of Leviticus is not just something we can just extract out. As if, oh, we've taken your appendix out, you don't even need it. We just take the we just take uh Leviticus 8 uh 22 and 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 Leviticus 20 13. Just take them out, you'll never miss it. No, it's embedded in creation, 
it's embedded in the teaching. I think it's embedded in Christ, uh, uh, you know, Christ teaching when he, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount and such like. It's explicitly talked about in the Apostle Paul. And then right at the very end in the book of Revelation, uh, we have uh, the moral code, particularly of sexual immorality, um, being excluded from God's kingdom. So that's why I call it the eschatological context, because it's in the book of Revelation. So right at the very last chapter, Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, it says this, Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. This is the new Jerusalem that's come down out of heaven. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Outside are the dogs. So people will say, will we, will we see our pets in heaven? I think yes. I think nothing in God's creation is wasted. I'm looking forward to seeing my pets. I've had two pet dogs. They're beautiful. And uh, and, and, and Sue and I are bound to get another. We I don't think I can, I'll be able to restrain ourselves. It's lovely living with animals. I don't mind. I grew up with a cat as well. Um, I don't know whether I'll meet Pussy Falloon in, 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 in heaven, but it'd be lovely uh, to. Um, we have such a bond with all animals. It's something part of, it's one of the blessings of creation, is it? You know, people... The relationship between humans and horses and, and with other animals and, and such, so it's, it's, it's lovely. Um, here, the dogs are outside. What's he meaning? How do you mean the dogs are outside? Well, I think one of the hints is earlier, the previous chapter in Revelation 21, verses 7 to 8. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he'll be my son. But as for the cowardly and the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It's another list, very similar to the one in Revelation 22, except that what was said to be the dogs is replaced by the detestable, that is, the, the that which is abominable. And why, uh, who are these dogs? Who are these detestable ones that's being referred to? And uh, you read the commentaries, uh, they'll have various ideas and such like. Uh, yes, they are the immoral people, sexually immoral, but that's also listed there. I actually think it goes back to, uh, I think it's a, a reference to Deuteronomy 23, verses 17 to 18. And uh, this is because of the ratio, uh, well, I might, I'll read it and then I'll talk about it. None of the daughters of Israel, it says in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, this is back to the books of Moses. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. And none of the sons of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. That is a male prostitute. Um, uh, you sh verse 18. You shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow. For both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. And so here the parallel is that giving your daughters to be at the, the temples of Baal to, to, uh, to uh, offering them for prostitution to other men or to offer your sons for homosexual sex with other men is um, not to be done. And the money that's being gained by that, you can't then say, oh, but it's, good. it's all for a good cause. Um, uh, you shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog. And here in its ancient Near Eastern cult, it makes perfect sense that this is, this is how uh, it was commonly re referred to uh, the, uh, the male homosexual passive partner. Uh, you shall not bring the wages of a, a dog into the house of the Lord. In Revelation, we've got the new te temple, the new Jerusalem, which is the temple of God. You shall not bring that which is abominable into the house. And therefore, I think this is the reference that's being made. So along with other sins, it's not, it's not what I'm, I'm not trying to single out, single it out, I hope you understand. I'm not trying to single out homosexual sex as being, I, I think it is described as an abomination. 
And then again, we've got to be careful with the word abomination, you see, because I'm using that word in its Bible context. If I was to, outside of the Bible context, outside of a sermon, use the word abomination, you can imagine how people would misunderstand that. They'll see that as hate speech. But we need, but we do need to learn to despise the things that God despises. Count it as an abominable, the things that God counts as abominable. Just in the same way that we are called to delight in what God delights in. Uh, and to uh, grow in those uh and then the fruits of the Spirit, the things that uh, bring glory to God. So here, uh, at the very last chapter, from creation through the Holiness Code of Leviticus, through the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, right through to the very end, um, immoral people, including homosexuality, uh, homosexual practice, is excluded uh, and is seen as, a, as an abomination uh, to God. Therefore, you see, we uh, we belong to a, a, did belong to a church that apparently uphold Article Seven that said we are bound by the moral law. Yet, we have decided to bless that which God cannot bless when we allow the blessing of same-sex relationships. So uh, there we go. That's a little bit controversial, isn't it? And I've gone a little bit over time. Uh, so I thank you for uh, your indulgence. And